Number 10, T-Rex arms. All right, mystery solved, folks. Have you ever wondered why a T-Rex, one of the biggest, baddest dinosaurs in the game, have you ever wondered why their arms are so tiny? What went wrong here? How did they get the short end of the DNA dino stick? Well, scientists may have an answer. They've spent decade after decade debating T-Rex arms, which first of all, it's a great job. And now at first, previous hypotheses suggested that their arms may have been used as pectoral claspers during mating or to get off the ground after falling over, both hilarious in the sense. But even so, there's other parts of the body that would have been used in that scenario. So it's almost like they're still useless. New studies this year suggest that these arms getting smaller was actually perfect. The arms of the T-Rex shriveled because there is an evolutionary advantage to keeping them out of the way. T-Rex, yeah, they would eat in groups. So more often than not, these idiots would bite their friend's arms off or their own. Yeah, so they shriveled them up, kept them out of the way. Bob's your uncle. You ever bite your own finger while you're eating food? That's a personal embarrassing moment. Number nine, Garfield phones. Okay, hello, look who's calling. The Garfield crave began back in 1978. Jim Davis brought to life this lasagna-loving, Monday-hating cats, the OG grumpy cat, really. And as his popularity grew, of course, so did his merch. A Garfield couch with eyes, that's really anybody wants, right, in life? But the last thing you would expect to find floating in the ocean are probably Garfield phones. Also, yes, I said phones, not one phone. Thousands of Garfield phones have been slowly washing up ashore in France for 30 years now. Imagine standing there looking at the ocean, thinking about your ex, pondering life, and then a Garfield phone washes up. You're like, ugh, fine, I'll call her. This began in the 80s, but until recently, we didn't know where they were coming from, which is pretty jarring. A farmer read about these phones in an article and how they could, you know, be hurting the environment, and he came forward and admitted he knew about the shipping container full of Garfield phones. Rene Morvin, this guy's been sitting on a national treasure, this huge secret. He says in the 80s, he found the shipping container in a sea cave, which, I mean, imagine thinking you found some sort of lost billions worth of treasures, but it's just this If the ocean gives you plastic phones, you answer it. Number eight, holes. If you have trypophobia, you may want to skip this one. I'm not gonna lie, it's pretty, it's pretty odd. Off the coast of Big Sur, California, a survey revealed about 15,000 holes, all underwater, just on the ocean floor. For some reason, they're all the same size and they all measure up to be around 11 meters wide and one meter deep. Now the team at Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, they found 15,000 of these and they found 5,000 more that are even larger. They're called micro depressions and the big ones are called pockmarks. Initially, scientists thought that methane under the seafloor, it was just coming out to say hello. Maybe that's the reason for these indents. And then they, of course, left a crater. Rovers went down there, tests were done. Turns out that's not the case. No methane is involved. In fact, there hasn't been any methane down there for 50,000 years. These MDs are essentially garbage trails and now there's deep sea creatures living in them. It's like a little underwater neighborhood, it's cute. They even found a whale skull just laying in one of them. Imagine that, imagine being a crab and coming home to that, I'd move. I'd move to the next micro depression immediately. Number seven, the city of Bai. Okay, so Romans, right? I mean, no one does it like the Romans do. Gold, marble, parties. When they sent it, buddy, it was full scent. Well, what if I told you that the Romans had a Las Vegas? Eh, well, sort of. Obviously, there wasn't a majestic city in the middle of the desert with slot machines, line dancers, and Elvis Presley, but both cities were both built by corrupt Italian leaders. Oh, look at that. Some of these guys wore armor, and the others wore suits, so it, yeah, kind of makes sense. The city of Bailly was a resort town in the modern sense. A lot of Roman emperors, politicians owned villas there, which attracted other wealthy folks. Kind of like Las Vegas. Despite even Caesar himself owning property here, the city now unfortunately rests under the water, where you can find remnants of Roman activity, fragments of street, pottery, statues, coins, the works. It's not every day you get to visit a Roman resort underwater. It's located in the Mediterranean Sea, just west of the Italian coast. It's close enough to the ocean for me. Close enough, I think it counts, it's pretty cool. Number six, Pavla Petri. Similar to Bailly, but on a much more discovered on accident kind of deal. In 1967, a man named Nicholas Fleming was snorkeling in the area and well, just so happened to see some weird stuff that he thought resembled a street. Naturally, when he got out of the water and told everybody, no one believed him. Said, yeah, right, you're not telling the truth yet. It's not true, you're not, no. But after the area was mapped out in 1968, well, it turns out he was telling the truth. Here was the sunken city of Pablo Petri. What they found there was surprising. There were streets, grids, and foundations of buildings remaining, even a small staircase. With all this evidence present, it's speculated that earthquakes around 1000 BCE are what sunk the city. However, what's most 
also interesting is that it's speculated they were there from around 2800 BCE. So they're there for a long time and the earthquake took them out. Kind of cool. The earthquakes are not cool, but the story's cool. Number five, the goblin shark. This animal is why I would hate being a scientist, but also would make for great TV. I get scared easily. It'd be kind of cool. Imagine there was a shark, but Mother Nature wasn't completely sold on the design. Okay, sure, it's fast and lethal and naturally blends into the waters to make an apex predator, but it, it just needs something more, Mother Nature said. Oh, I know. Let's add nail-like teeth and an extendable jaw. Oh, and, and a Jedi sixth sense. Yeah. That sounds right. Yes. That is right. The goblin sharks are the weird distant cousin of the shark. They live at the bottom of the ocean floor and eat pretty much whatever they can find down there. They hunt in darkness using their elongated snout that has literally a spider sense when something gets close to it and a jaw that extends to help them grab food. It's like having Commando Pro from MW2 if anyone remembers that. Remember that one? That was hard. That was a tough perk, man. It got in the way of a lot of things. It just goes to show that there's a lot of weird things at the bottom of the ocean and it, it really, I, I, we, I wouldn't be surprised if we find some more weird stuff down there. It's gonna happen one day. Number four, shipwreck of the San Jose. San Jose was part of the Spanish treasure fleet in the early 1700s, which in case you didn't know, was basically big boats for carrying all their loot and booty back to Spain. These ships were filled with everything of value, spices, tobacco, booze, silver, gems, metals, and most importantly, gold. Oh yes. I mean, that was the reason why they were there. She sank in 1708, but not too far from Colombia. She was eventually found by the Colombian Navy and has since been guarded as a state secret. Hmm, I wonder why. Hmm. The estimated value of the loot inside the ship's hull is to be worth around 15 billion dollars US. Wow, that's a lot of money. Number three, raining spiders. Back in 2015, and you guessed it, Australia, residents of Goulburn woke up to the town just being caked in spiders. This is my nightmare. This is, I think, yeah, this is my absolute biggest fear. Everything was webbed. They were tiny black spiderlings all over the place. Resident Ian Watson told reporters that, quote, when I looked up at the sun, it was like this tunnel of webs going up for a couple of hundred meters into the sky, end quote. Also, delete memory, thanks. Rick Vetter, an entomologist at the University of California at Riverside, says that many spiders are just ballooning around us, but thankfully, they all don't do it at the same time like this situation. Yeah, this is happening all the time, so keep your heads up or down. I'd rather not look. Number two, giant pipes. Back in 2017, these massive industrial pipes washed up along the shores of the northern Norfolk coast. Now, if I was swimming and I saw this thing floating towards me, I would faint. I would think it's a giant sea snake or something. I would have no idea what I was looking at. These things were massive. Terrible discovery, but again, pretty exciting. I didn't realize how big these were at first, and then I zoomed in. I think I have some mechanophobia now. Where did they come from? Well, these pipes were lost at sea following an accident on an Iceland shipping container, which resulted in 500 meter long pipes coming loose. Yeah, that's so scary. Luckily, you can see these things coming, but that's still jarring. I would think it's a submarine emerging out of the water, God. The company that produced them, Pipe Life, Great name, rather fitting. They urge the curious to stay far away. Do not approach them. You can see them coming because they're the size of buildings, so they can obviously easily crush a human being. These ocean pipes have a diameter of two meters, and the longest one that washed up on the beach was 500 meters long. Number one, three kittens. Back in 2020, an oil worker named Drayton Dewich found three kittens all frozen to the ground near Drayton Valley. They were alive, but just, you know, very cold. It was mid-January, everything is frozen. This was near an oil well that he'd been working on, right? Those are always freezing cold. On Facebook, they posted about how the three kittens were all males, dewormed and living under the same roof now, and they were much warmer. He just found three little pets and brought them home. He got them out of the ice by using coffee to melt the ice. That's amazing. I said it once before and I'll say it again, coffee saves lives. He's like, oh yeah, look at that. They're alive. Number 10, the endurance. This one is just incredible. Enter the time of adventurers, when setting sail with a crew of hardy men and the hopes of discovery was just the way of life. What to discover? Well, that's anything and anywhere, friends. Their fame and fortune await. This was true of Sir Ernest Shackleton, a man who was seeking his own destiny and adventure. He famously boarded a ship called the Endurance and with a motley crew set sail for the Antarctic waters. Things were going great until they weren't. 
That's a classic line, isn't it? The ship got stuck in ice, and despite the crew's best efforts, the ship was beginning to lose its fight and sank. Miraculously, though, all crew survived, including Shackleton. Pretty amazing story. The ship was lost under the icy waters for years, thought to be lost forever. That was until March of this year, March of 2022, it was found. And even more surprisingly, she was mostly intact and preserved due to the frigid temperatures of the water. Ooh, nice. Number nine, Rosetta Stone. What if I told you the reason why we understand so much of the ancient world and ancient Egypt is because of a small dictator from France who had an ego issue? Sounds fake, right? Well, actually, it's true. Napoleon Bonaparte, the Corsican ogre as he was also known, during his reign of fame and military power, he went on tour in Egypt. And I mean, why not? It's hot, sunny, and you got those pyramids. How can you say no? It's beautiful. Well, like something out of Call of Duty Zombies, Napoleon took his army boys and a couple of egghead archaeologists to uncover the hidden secrets. That's when the Rosetta Stone was found. A large stone tablet that was inscribed three times with three different languages, but all saying the same thing. Thus, it helped us understand and decipher ancient Egyptian language and unlocked many other secrets as well. Pretty, pretty, pretty shocking find. Number 8. Pompeii Imagine a sunny day like any other. You're a Roman citizen walking through a market as it hustles and bustles during a bright afternoon. The smell of small restaurants fill the air. The playful sound of friends chatting Way charms the background. Then the ground violently shakes and a thick black ash covers the city. Within a few short hours, like a scene from Revenge of the Sith, lava flows everywhere and the people are buried in burning hot ash and smoke. Oof, no thanks. I don't want the Darth Vader treatment. Pompeii is an interesting story. It wasn't rediscovered in one major excavation, but rather people kept walking over it and going, huh, I wonder what this is. And that's pretty much it. Excavation after excavation eventually led to modern scientists to rediscover discover the city and in a quite well preserved state actually, surprisingly. An ancient restaurant was found not too long ago complete with mosaics. That's pretty cool. That's pretty sweet. Number 7. Amelia Earhart Remains The first woman to fly across the Atlantic was well on her way to setting even more groundbreaking records, but her plane tragically disappeared over the Pacific in 1937. And it's since been a great mystery where the final resting place of Amelia Earhart now is. But we may have actually found her remains back in 1940 without really knowing. They were found on the Pacific island of Nakumarora. Now, the initial examination of these remains were reported to be that of a man. That was the general idea in 1941. Come 2018, however, now we have a different idea. Could it be? Researcher Richard Johns took another look at the long lost remains, and since those days, we've learned more about Amelia Earhart. Photos have since surfaced online, so we compared the bone measurements to her body type, and they're pretty sure that they found our missing aviator. Number six, abandoned whiskey. This one's pretty fun, dare I say, a little exciting? I don't know. An explorer found crates in a hut belonging to another explorer, that of Ernest Shackleton. You've probably heard of him before, it's pretty huge. Anything belonging to our boy Ernest Shackleton is a treasure, especially when it's frozen bottles of scotch. That's pretty lovely. It's probably the best case scenario, really, evidently. It's 2010 and you find 100 year old frozen scotch that Ernest Shackleton once drank. What do you do? Do you drink it? Do you save it? A little bit of both. I would do a bit of both. This may be the best discovery on this list, or at least the happiest. It's been locked up, of course, since, you know, such a historical find, but you'll be happy to know that a sample was given to Scottish distiller White and McKay. They're now studying this recipe to try and bring it back to life, which is amazing. Number five, surprise Nikes. I threw shoes on my holiday wish list this year, and every year for that matter. Nothing like a nice fresh pair of sneaks. Sometimes you find the perfect shoes, and sometimes they find you. In the mid 90s, a shipment of Nike shoes heading to the US was lost during this crazy storm. Around five shipping containers fell into the sea, so later on, 61,000 pairs of shoes just started to drift towards the west coast. Just all mar just making their little way, just slowly but surely. That's terrifying. People saw shoes in the water. Do you know how afraid I would be if a shoe brushed against my shoulder while I was swimming? My brain would go to the darkest places. So scary. These shoes luckily didn't belong to anybody, but they did all have the same serial number by chance. So what started as this ocean mystery ended up working out for the better. Nike lost a lot of money and we tracked the shoe's journey. So now we oddly learned more about our ocean currents. Well, Nike lost money. Win-win. Number four, 
2021 rocket. Remember last year in May when a large piece of space junk was just gonna crash land somewhere on Earth and we had no idea where it was gonna hit? Possible Avengers level threat. We're all just looking at Twitter, refreshing, like, mm, where's it gonna be? Where did it land? Well, at the time, this was one of the biggest pieces of human-made space junk to ever crash towards Earth, so it was a little jarring. They said it would land in New York or New Zealand. One of the two, okay, gamble, let's do it, 50-50. The debris came from the lost March 5B rocket and landed in the Indian Ocean, luckily, with most of it burning up upon re-entry. Now, usually, when rockets discard pieces, it's done so strategically, falling into the ocean, normally the Atlantic, in a graveyard, this was not supposed to happen. Thankfully, it didn't land in New York. That, again, would have been terrifying. It would look like Loki's arrived. What's what's that? Is that a meteor? Are we done? Number three, Bigus Chedicus. How many of you folks like cheese? I'm, I'm willing to bet it's a lot of you. I know I do. My favorite is mozzarella, especially from a mom and pop pizza shop or homemade Italian cuisine. Oh, baby, it's the best. I'm not Italian, but I love the communities. Watch out, little Italy. Here I come. I'm gonna eat all your pizza. In a recent discovery in Egypt, archaeologists came across ancient cheese, of all things. Who would have thought? Which may be the oldest cheese ever to be found. Estimated to be 3,200 years old and composed of goat's milk. Mm. While it might be tempting to dive in and take a slice of the cheese, oh, yes, as aristocrats are known to do, I would hold back as it is also found to have bacteria called brucellos, which is not good for your health. It will make you very sick, so don't eat it. Number two, I think I stepped in something. I personally find it very fascinating when we dig up something from the past, or really just discover anything from the past. For years, that artifact sat there as the world went on. It's kind of it's a weird thought for me. I don't know. For me, it's even more impressive if the item is in good condition and helps give us a better view into the past. Take the 5,000 year old leather shoe found in an Armenian cave for example. The laces on this bad boy were still in good condition, which is very impressive. It's a long time. So what's the secret? The shoe was found in a pile of ye olde manure. Supposedly this had some sort of restorative properties on the shoe, although I'm not rushing to try it and I don't recommend anyone else does either. Number 1. Turkish Delight In 1963, a man was doing renovations on his home. After a trip in 1960, Turkish Home Depot, he began his work. After knocking down a wall, he found a hidden room, which then led to a tunnel. And that tunnel led to the lost city of Derinkuyu. Yes, this man had a whole ancient city right underneath him. Honey, there's an ancient city beneath us! The city proved to be massive, with an estimated population of 20,000 people, complete with livestock. Uh, they weren't there, obviously, it's just the, what they thought it would hold. So, for those of our viewers living in older homes, make sure to check behind your walls. You may have some secrets hidden there. Ooh, wouldn't that be cool. Number 10, Serpent Mound. The Great Serpent Mound is a 1400 foot long, three foot high prehistoric effigy located in Peebles, Ohio, United States. Serpent Mound was first reported via surveyors Ephraim Squire and Edwin Davis and was featured in their Ancient Monuments of Mississippi book back in 1848. Looks just like a regular golf course, doesn't it? But underneath, it's perfectly placed and well preserved earth formations that were made by hand to align with something in the sky. The mound is the largest serpent effigy in the world. Yeah, big snake. The mound itself winds back and forth for more than 800 feet with its tail coiling in seven different areas. Tons of Clovis era spearheads have been found that indicate interaction with other groups of ancient humans along with the Denisovans and the Neanderthals. Archaeologists believe that the mound's creation was influenced by two astronomical events. The light from the supernova Crab Nebula in 1054 and Halley's Comet in 1066. The mound is also located on an ancient meteorite impact location location, which makes things absolutely way scarier. In 2003, geologists from Ohio State University and Glasgow said the meteorite impact origin of the structure at Serpent Mound is the best evidence for its build and importance. Yeah, nothing crazy, just a mile long, cosmically aligned serpent made out of rocks, made from prehistoric dudes who could barely work fire right on top of a huge impact location. Yeah. Something's fishy here. Number nine, the Terracotta Army. Hey, if you dig what we do here on Bumblebee, make sure you hit us up with a like button or comment down below which discovery in ancient history has you laying awake at night. I know mine. Let me know, I'll check it out. The Terracotta Army, don't even get me started, was first discovered in 1974 by a group of farmers east of the Queen Emperor's Tomb Mound at Mount Lee. For centuries, reports mentioned pieces of the terracotta fragments found, roofing tiles, bits of brick, masonry, but when they discovered heads of clay bodies, yeah, the Chinese archaeologists started to investigate and dig a little bit deeper. To this day, it remains the largest pottery group ever found on Earth. The Terracotta Army is a collection of sculptures 
depicting the armies of the Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China. Apparently a form of funerary art buried with the emperor around 209 BCE with the purpose of protecting him in the afterlife. 8,000 soldiers, 130 chariots, 520 horses, and 150 cavalry. Yeah. That's a lot of protection. The site is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site and has been since 1987. I'm just getting Medusa vibes when I look at this, you know? Like, I'm not convinced the actual purpose of this operation. Like, was it a front? Were they once alive? Who knows, dude? This place is mysterious. But cool. Number eight, the Antikythera Mechanism. The Antikythera Mechanism is an anomaly ancient computer that uses the cosmos to predict astronomical events. A group of sea sponge divers discovered the Antikythera shipwreck in early 1900 just off the island in Greece. Hence, the name. I find it funny that divers diving for something you wipe your butt with found an ancient computer just chilling down there. Something about that makes me laugh. Many think it's cursed too due to its first handlings. Apparently after its discovery, three of the divers who dove down died shortly after its find. 150 feet deep just off Point Glyphadia, the team retrieved millions in worth of bronze, marble, pottery, glassware, jewelry, coins, and of course, this ancient MacBook. This device is made entirely out of a single bronze sheet built within a wooden case about the size of a shoebox. Faces and cogs covered in Greek inscriptions indicating the device's astronomical calendar, purpose, use, basically everything we have in our iPhone right now within this wooden box 2,200 years ago. Yeah, again, collecting sea sponges to wipe our butts with and then just stumbling upon a computer. I don't know. Someone's getting a raise. I'll say that. Number seven, the Terracotta Army. Well, we all have that favorite thing we love. For me, it's it's video games. I, I love video games. I'd say comedy, but it's kind of hard to take that with you when you pass away. I'll try though. We'll see. For years, kings and leaders tried their best to take things with them in the afterlife. Egyptians were so worried they had to take their cats and dogs with them. Or at least they tried. They did. Well, very famously, the first emperor of China tried to take a terracotta army with him. Or rather, an army to protect him in the afterlife. Yes, Emperor Qin was famously buried with soldiers to protect him in the afterlife. Thing is, this wasn't a handful we're talking about, but hundreds in all shapes and sizes, which is really crazy, actually. Discovered by farmers attempting to dig a well in 1974, they came to unmass a huge burial site with soldiers and cavalry, all with bronze swords that were quickly looted. It makes sense. It's one of the biggest discoveries of all time. In the archaeology department, at least. Pretty cool. Pretty sick. Number six, the Nazca Lines. At some point, there was a dude walking in the southern Peruvian desert and saw some lines on the ground and thought, gee, those are some funny looking lines there. Huh. And when he went to a higher elevation and looked back at it, well, it looked like it was a larger image, he must have thought to himself. Ah, it's probably nothing. Well, once humans had gained the ability to fly, the images were much clearer. In a large portion of the Peruvian desert are long but shallow trenches dug in the ground. The resulting product is images and that of Mesoamerican drawings of animals, like a spider, a monkey, and a bird, and most recently, a cat. It's weird. It's weird animals on the ground. I don't know. It's just kind of strange. Question is, who done it? That is the question. That's always the question for archaeology, isn't it? No one is really sure who done it, actually. And it also begs the question, if you were to dig all these drawings, who would see them but God and or aliens? That's kind of a weird thing to understand. Who would see that? No one's up there back then, right? Strange. Number five, Titanic. Before 1997, the Titanic was one of those aquatic mysteries. For those that have been captivated by it sinking from stories and tales from survivors, people wanted to know her final resting place. And yes, I know it wasn't 1997, but that was when every person on planet Earth knew what the Titanic was. Thanks to Terminator director James Cameron. Kind of a weird thing to do after Terminator, but okay. And teenage heartthrob Leonardo DiCaprio. And maybe, maybe a lady, but you know, you know what I'm talking about. It was actually rediscovered on September 1st, 1985 at 3,500 meters below the ocean surface, which if you didn't know, is, a, is, pretty deep, is pretty deep down there. It's not every day you discover an unsinkable ship thought to be lost forever at the bottom of the ocean. Pretty exciting. Number four, remains of Richard III. Richard III, the king of England and Ireland. And if you go by how Shakespeare describes him, well, he's a rotten man, he is, sir. A hunchback with an irregular walk. In real life, well, not so much. But that's because Shakespeare wrote it during the time period when the monarch was the monarch to get rid of the monarch that was Richard III's 
monarch. It's just good politics, it makes sense. Despite what Shakespeare said about him, he still wasn't great. Who was back then? No one really was. During the many years since the Mad King's passing, it seems his remains were lost. Until one day in 2014, his remains were dug up in a parking lot of all places. Who would have thought? Just where a king like that would have wanted to be. Kind of strange to dig up one of the country's kings on the job of a, on the day of a construction job. It's kind of weird. You know, you're just average day, and you're like, oh. There's a former King England, cool. You know what I mean? It's kind of weird. Number three, the mother of dragons. Mary Anning was an English fossil collector, dealer, and paleontologist who became famously known around the world for her discoveries in Jurassic marine fossil beds in the cliffs along the English Channel at Lyme Regis in southwest England. I'm not talking about finding a tooth or something. She found three species of dinosaurs, like three different species o dinosaur. Anning's findings contributed to a massive scientific research, pushing prehistoric academia towards the future. In 1811, when Mary was only 12, she found a bizarre fossilized skull. Mary then searched for and dug the outline of its 5.2 meter long skeleton, and by the time she was done, everyone in the town knew that she had discovered something important. Scientists thought this was some sort of ancient crocodile. People were puzzled. Ten years later, she discovers a completely new skeleton of plesiosaur. Two years later, she found one with wings. Today, the Natural History Museum in London showcases several of Mary Anning's historic finds, including her ichthyosaurus, plesiosaur, and pterosaur. Dude, there needs to be like at least three movies about her on Netflix, no? Like Jurassic Park, England. Number two, Gobekli Tepe. This mysterious ancient site in the southeastern Anatolia region of Turkey is dated between 1000 and 12,000 BCE. The site comprises of a number of large man-made structures supported by massive stone megalithic pillars. Gobekli Tepe, or known simply as Potbelly Hill, is the oldest place of which megaliths were mounted. The oldest like ever, and most confusing. Pillars richly decorated with promorphic details, clothing, wild animals, fauna, star systems. Archaeologists are puzzled, to say the least. Famous German archaeologist Klaus Schmidt views Gobekli Tepe as a Stone Age sanctuary. Radiocarbon dating indicates that it contains the oldest known ruins that holster butchered bones of not only deer, but pigs, birds, geese, fish. They've been identified as cooked food, prepared for large groups as festivals or feasts. Yeah, they don't really know exactly exactly what this place was used for, but after finding all this academia and scientific knowledge, it's certain that this place was used by scholars of high order to either teach or study the skills of masonry, as well as the cosmos. And it's only been about a tenth discovered so far. Yeah, just about one tenth. Who knows what other secrets Quebecly Tepe has to unveil? Let's get those other nine tenths uh, undug, no? And the number one spot, ancient Greek shipwreck. The oldest ancient Greek shipwreck ever discovered in the Black Sea, and you would never guess by looking at it. This ship is from 400 BC. It's an ancient Greek trading vessel. Not huge, but somehow, this ship has been kept in almost perfect condition for over 2,400 years, a mile below the sea surface. The lack of oxygen actually preserved the ship, and that's why it looked like it sank last year, not thousands of years. Years ago. John Adams, principal investigator with the Black Sea Archaeology Project, describes the finding as something he never thought was even possible, let alone something he'd witnessed with his own eyes in his lifetime. This discovery changed what we know about ships in the ancient world. It is to date the oldest intact shipwreck ever known to mankind. It can't be beat. This thing is older than most curses. I say pull it up, slap some paint on her, get her going again, no? Quality versus quantity back then? Things were just built to last back then. History. Number 10, the Antikythera device. I think I said that right. The Antikythera mechanism or device, I mean, this sounds like something straight out of Call of Duty Zombies, but the discovery comes to us straight from the magical land of antiquity, the land of marble, democracy, and olive oil. Very nice, beautiful. It's more Italian than Greek, but okay, we're gonna go with it. In 1901, Greek divers found a shipwreck not too far from the island of Antikythera. Naturally, they looked in to see what was inside. Remnants of cargo included pottery, coins, jewels, and a strange gear like device. Later, it was dubbed the Antikythera device. It was also later discovered to be that of a very early analog computer. Ooh. It was a fancy way of saying a basic or manual power computer that calculates simple solutions or that of a singular solution. It might not sound like much, but to me, it's a very unique find. Sure, this machine was simple, but it makes us wonder what else may have been lost to time. It's thought to have been used as an astrological calendar, aiding the user in mapping out where the sun and moon will be on different dates. Pretty cool. Pretty, I don't know how to 
do they do that though? That's, you know what I mean? Like, how do they think of that? I couldn't even think of that. I'm a modern guy. Jeez. Number nine, purple orb. I've been around for a little while now, and in my scientific research, I've seen my fair share of orbs. You got Goku's Kamehameha, you got the orbs in Mario Party. Heck, I've chased so many orbs in Call of Duty Zombies, I've lost count. The point I'm making here is I know an orb when I see an orb. I know one when I see one. The purple orb found at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean floor, not too far from the California coast. Well, frankly, I have no idea what this is, said also the scientist who discovered it in 2016 while exploring the ocean floor. Scientists discovered a purple spherical blob, aptly named Blobus purplus. You, you can't get better than that, folks. Naturally, using a very high-tech device called a vacuum, we sucked that bad boy up like a farmer gets sucked up in a UFO in the middle of a cornfield in Arkansas. For further analysis, of course, what else? The verdict? Eh, we ain't too sure yet. It could be some form of sea slug, but if that's the case, it's the first purple one ever caught, showing that if you look hard enough, you can find shiny Pokemon too. <laughs> Number eight, the Megalodon. This one goes out to all the people who went to see a movie called Jaws in the 70s and had no idea what they were in for. I can only imagine what kind of pants swelling experience that must have been. For our younger audience to understand, there just wasn't any movie like Jaws around back then. It was pretty unique. A summer blockbuster and it changed film forever, honestly. It also made people think twice about going into deep water at the beach. You never know, I know this is, that was a movie, but you, you never know, <laughs> said people. Well, what if I told you Jaws weren't too far from the truth? Yes, that's right, folks. Fossils have been found dating back to 20 million years ago, and these fossils belong to that of the mega shark. The Megalodon. A great white shark is anywhere between four and a half meters to around eight meters at the most. The Meg, as she's commonly called, she's estimated to be around 17 meters. That's over 50 feet in American, folks. That, that, that's a big fish, man. While a full fossil has never been found, teeth and some bone paint an image of a very beastly fish. Not what I want to cross. I don't, I just stay out of the water. I like water, but I like swimming pools, chlorine. I'd rather swim in pee than with sharks. Okay, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm here, that's what I'm here to tell you, folks. Number seven, the Codex Gigas. Basically translates to giant book, Codus Gigas, and it's giant. 170 pounds, it's the largest medieval manuscript in the world. Also known as the Devil's Bible. Yeah, due to the highly detailed full page portrait of Satan himself, the demonology written within, and the legend around its initial creation. Made out of 180 donkeys, the famous myth is that a scribe traded his soul to the Prince of Darkness so that he could complete and master the contents of the universe written within this one book. Comprised in only one night. Created in the early 13th century in the Benedictine Monastery of Bohemia, now modern day Czech Republic, this book's creepy. Yeah, it contains the complete Bible, like the Old One and the New Testament, as well as everything medicinal and cosmological that a human would know at Earth at that time. All written in Latin, and of course predated glyphs, and of course missing the last 10 pages of the book. Yep, ripped out and missing. I don't know. Who knows? The book lays in the National Library of Sweden in Stockholm. I wouldn't go near it. I wouldn't read it. I wouldn't even touch it. You know, I'm good with goosebumps. That scares me enough. Number six, the oldest map. A 4,000 year old stone slab first discovered over a century ago in France may be the oldest known map in Europe, according to a new study. The slab dates back to the early Bronze Age, 4,000 years ago. It was first discovered in 1900 in a prehistoric burial site in Finisterre, France. The engravings on the broken stone appear to resemble topographic features including hills, reference points, and river networks. The broken slab, which is four meters long, was moved to a private museum in France in 1924. It was then stored in a French castle where it gathered dust until it was rediscovered in the castle cellar in 2014. But only recently are researchers beginning to understand the actual importance behind this prehistoric slab rock. It's been interpreted as the oldest cartographical map in Europe. Yeah, that's old. Number five, the Voynich Manuscript. There's a giant Italian Renaissance folio called the Voynich manuscript. It's named after Wilfred Voynich, a book dealer who purchased it in 1912, and to this day, we don't really know what it is. Hands down, the most mysterious book of all time. Not only is it detailed so carefully and patiently, it's basically like a Tim Burton take on a book about life, with an entire world drawn and recorded that isn't ours. Like, parallel universe type stuff. Even the language is unknown. Like, unknown unknown. Like, predates Latin and doesn't use phonetic patterns and coding. The riddle of all riddles. Written somewhere between 14 1405 and 1450, all 240 pages are inscribed in some sort of indecipherable language of about 170,000 characters. Historians and cartographers have tried to crack the code for hundreds of years, yet not one has been successful. Why wasn't this a national treasure movie? I feel like this would have been perfect, like Nicolas Cage, you know? 
I don't know. Number four, the Nazca Lines. The ancient, very mysterious geoglyphs that make up the soil of the Nazca Desert in southern Peru is an old one. They were created, we think, somewhere between 1000 BCE and 500 AD. Basically, people would make impressions or shallow incisions on the desert floor, removing pebbles, leaving colored dirt exposed, drawing some sort of depictions of fauna and humanoid scribbles for only those above Earth to visually see. Basically what I'm trying to say here is that these are giant ancient unknown drawings you can only accurately depict from space or from like drones hundreds of miles in the air. In the years leading up to 2020, between 80 and 100 new figures have been found with the use of drones and cameras since at least year 1900. Yo, who's drawing these things? And why is the mountain range just so perfectly square and flat like it's been laser cut to draw on? More than 70 designs are zoomorphic, including birds, spiders, fish, lizards, and of course, humans. Lots of different shapes and clothing and builds of humans. Interesting. It became a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1994. Yeah, I'd like to think so. I feel like this is going to be on Art Attack. Number three, the big squid. This one is simple. In the last couple years, both unmanned expeditions and cameras attached to deep sea drilling rigs have caught footage of giant squids. This is impressive for two reasons. One, their size. I mean, these guys are massive and well, two, because of their elusive nature and the fact they live really far down in the ocean, we just don't know that much about them and or have that much footage on them. So we take anything we can get. The largest squid on record from head to, uh, well, tentacle or appendage, whatever you want to call it, measured in at a whopping 43 feet. That's a big, that's a, that's a big squid, man. It's almost hard to imagine creatures living that far down there that big. It's a good thing it's difficult for us to get down there. Not that I have any interest going down there, it's just, you know, it's... I'm not so scared. I'm not scared. I'm scared. I'm a little scared. I'm a little scared. Number two, anglerfish. Here's another horror from the depths of the ocean. Folks around my age may recall the anglerfish from the terrifying moment in the SpongeBob SquarePants movie. Movies and media is how I relate to things. Just trust me. Remember the part with the ice cream? Remember he's got the ice cream and he's eating them? Remember that part? Yeah, it's weird. Anglerfish are best known for their third appendage that in some anglerfish possess the ability of bioluminescence or like a fluffy antenna that kind of just hangs off the forehead. What's the reason for this decorative dancey bit? Well, it's to lure in food. Uh, like a fishing lure that we would use. Kind of cool. That's when it strikes with its razor sharp teeth and the most awful surprise attack ever from probably one of the most, if not the ugliest fish out of the ocean. Number one, crop circles. Most crop circles that you find are found in cornfields in middle America, where people claim that little green men came to visit them in the middle of the night. I swear it's by. Well, as some divers discovered in 1995, there were crop circles at the bottom of the ocean, but what could make those, aliens? No one knew what was causing them. Well, it turns out that in 2011, the mystery was solved. It was actually a cute pufferfish, or I say one, it was actually a species of cute pufferfish that were making art on the ocean floor with their fins in hopes of recruiting a mate. It's a good thing I don't have to use art because I was never good at trying. It wouldn't go very well. Good thing I got cute little blue eyes. Oh my goodness. 